I am Dave Tiefteller, and how many of you have actually been involved in the building or design of a canoe launch? Hands-on building? How many of those? How many of those? Okay. Uh, it's, it's not an easy task. I'm sure you all will agree with that. Uh, several years ago, when Donna and I first started working on canoe launches, uh, we uh, we thought, well, this is a simple matter, you know, you just go out and we know the materials, it's going to be an easy thing to do. Uh, and I thought, at the time, if I'd been asked to do a presentation, I could have covered it all in, in detail in 15 minutes. And now I realize, after several uh, construction projects, that I could spend all weekend and not even touch the subject. So this is going to be very superficial, and a lot of what I have here, which I will try to um, go past very quickly, has already been touched on. Um, we're going to make some uh, initial assumptions here that the um, that all these things are actually in place. Uh, but they've all been agreed to to some point or discussed um, before, so uh, I won't even deal with this. The uh, basic considerations that I always think about when we start working on a project like this is um, what type of use will the site have? Is it going to be primarily used by canoeists, kayakers, fishermen, motorized or unmotorized, non-motorized watercraft? Uh, the size of the body of water, how, and how much does it change throughout the year? Whether it's a white water spring, flat water, or a lake. The, uh, and also, who, who's going to be using the launch site? Is it going to be primarily families? Is it going to be groups? Is it going to be individual paddlers? Day paddlers, uh, through paddlers, and campers. Uh, and the other thing that Ann mentioned also is uh, what are going to be the special needs of the site? Are you going to have to make accommodations for handicap access? Sometimes in your permitting process, that will be something that will be have to be considered. And how often will the site be used and um, how, what will be the frequency and the amount of use of, of it? Uh, this photograph here, as you can see, is uh, getting quite a bit of use. We have one site in Gilmer County on the Cartier River. And in the summertime, we're getting three to 600 folks a day using that site. So that's great. We have a really unintended consequence of um, um, building a launch. And that's come with a lot of issues as far as neighborhoods and um, vandalism and all sorts of things. So you, re you really have to think about the unintended consequences of creating a launch. The other, um, let's see, did I go too far here? Yeah. The um, other thing you have to think about is the actual type of construction that you're going to use. The, um, and that really has to be dictated by the, these other, uh, other considerations. You can have something as simple as you know, the stone stair step or something as complex as poured concrete. Okay. You have to excuse me as I thumb through this here. The other thing you may need to consider also is what kind of amenities are going to be needed. Um, a lot of the sites that we've worked on have actually been in parks where we have other things going on, picnic areas. You have to consider the need for parking areas, the need for trails that will actually go into the uh, site itself. One site that we built, uh, we had to put in a 50-yard uh, trail um, that had to be maintained. That was a requirement by the Department of Natural Resources. We hadn't planned on having to create this trail because there was a, a path way there already. But we actually had to come back and do a fixed trail as part of the uh, to get our permit. Uh, if you have any camping involved, then you got to think about well, what are those camping facilities going to be? So suddenly, you're no longer just in the uh, canoe launch building business, but you're in the campsite building business. And as you can see, we have down in Carter's Lake, we actually have uh, two paddle in campsites down there now. So you can actually paddle in, spend the night or a couple of nights, and then paddle on down the lake and down the river. 
uh, even if you don't have to do a formal environmental impact statement, it's really important to consider the impact that your site is going to have on the environment. The, uh, you know, the plants that will have to be destroyed, if any. Uh, if there's any historical significance to the area, how you'll maintain that. The, uh, the erosion of the area. Uh, I come to all of this from a water keeper uh, side of the business, and we're very primarily concerned about erosion and um, sedimentation control. So we certainly don't want to build a site that's going to add to those problems. If anything, we want our site to help alleviate those problems. And oftentimes that can be done. And this gets down to the last point here is disturbance of the property owners. And that goes back to what I mentioned before with having as many folks as we have on the river. So you really have to think about that as well. Uh, the vegetation, of course, you really have to think about how you're, how you're going to remove it. The soil type and materials. Uh, one of the important things that people don't often think about is if you're doing this construction, you're going to remove the material more often than not. During that construction period, you're going to have to store that material. You're going to have to make sure that you have some place on site to actually store your material and have some method of getting it off the site as well. You have to look at the um, terrain of the area. Uh, this may or may not dictate that you have to choose another site. The, uh, you know, if you have a nice gentle sloping area, that's going to be fine. If you have a, a very steep eroded bank like this, it's going to present all kinds of trouble that you're going to have to overcome. Another big consideration are the flow changes in the stream that you're going to be working with. You know, whether it's seasonal or if it's uh, regulated by a dam of some sort, you know, it's a tailwater. Um, and you also need to look at your flood stages that you'll have throughout you know, the, the 10 year flood, the 100 year flood. Uh, most of us can't design a canoe launch for a 100 year flood. For instance, on the Cardike, we had a 100 year flood several years ago that, rose the, that brought the river up 26 feet. It wiped out all the bridges, so obviously, canoe launches are going to be wiped out in that process as well. So, you've got to consider at what point you're willing to lose the work that you've done. And you have to look at the anomalies of the stream. Ideally, you're going to have a sort of a quiet area that you can launch your boats into, but that may, may not be possible. You may have um, whirlpools or you may have back eddies that you're going to have to deal with, or boulders or whatever. And you can't really go into the river and remove those. And I think we've talked about the um, site limitations. The, the big thing that you have to think about also is the, um, the limitations that government are going to replace on you as far as getting your permit. If you look at the uh, canoe launch on the right there, that's in the Carter K track, the um, Carter K WMA in Gilmer County. It's a stair step. That's not an ideal canoe launch, but we had to build that to accommodate the DNR because they wanted no more impact than that on their site. So, we have essentially a, a you know, four and a half foot wide staircase going down to the river. I'd like to get some of those guys out to call my 17 foot canoe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But on downstream, of course, we have an upstream, we have much larger, more conventional uh, launches. Uh, the other the thing you have to think about is how you're going to get your people your materials and the equipment into the site. In the mountains, we have limited access to a lot of these areas, so that is a real consideration. More, than a lot, more often than not, you're going to bring in some heavy equipment, even whether it's a backhoe or whatnot. You have to think about locally how you're going to get the materials to your site, whether it's the lumber or the surge stone or the gravel. And, of course, the big bugaboo in all this is your budget. That's really going to dictate a lot of it. Uh, how much you got to spend, how much you can raise to do the work. So, in the construction, you really need to think about these, and I'll read through this, but obviously that's, these are major considerations. Um, you have to think, too, about how you're going to accommodate your workers while you're on site. That's a big consideration a lot of people don't think about. You may need porta potties uh, or something like that. So uh, to wrap up uh, quickly here, 
It's really important to do all your homework. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. This has all been done before. So seek out the people that have done it before and utilize their experience. You can often learn more from their failures than you can from their successes. And I've got, I personally have quite a few failures that I can talk to you about to enlighten you on those. Um, seek professional assistance. There are a lot of us out there that have actually done this. Uh, we know what we're doing sometimes, and we're more than, not, more than willing to be able to have assistance. And the big thing is be patient. This is not something you can do overnight. Government's involved. Citizens are involved. So it's going to take a while to get everything worked out. And I think I've got another second or two here. Well, I will mention this. Um, the site must dictate your, uh, the design and the construction. Someone mentioned that we have a template. There is no such thing as a template because each site is different. Um, the construction techniques, the materials are going to be different. So uh, this is just a real quick thing here of some of the work that we've actually done on sites. Are there any questions real quick? Yeah. One thing you haven't covered, which I have some of the bad experience with, is resilting when you have water levels changing. Uh, and I was wondering if you've ever come up with any designs that allow, that not allowed for the, how do I say it, for a, an energy form and therefore dumping all the mud and slimes where you would be with the water down. Well, this, that's a good example, right? Uh, right back here where we actually have, this is on the Lola where we actually have a lot of mud. Um, that's just part of it, I think. I don't know how much you have someone actually going out and cleaning out. The thing that you want to make sure that doesn't happen is that you get undercut underneath your structure. And that's the really critical thing. Well, we were playing with the idea of actually trying to have a, a, a design where the, at, a, at higher levels the water actually came in and, and went over of course, that would be a very stable design. Right, exactly. As long as there's a current, you don't have well, to, you know, the silt Well, we have variations in um, flow. We always build these terrace launches. So at high water, you, oh, yeah. you've got a high level you know, to use, and at lower level, you have lower levels. Anything else? Uh, yeah. What sort of challenges do you face with a buffer zone and a land disturbing permit? I mean, is that one of those activities that you vary by county by county? It does vary county by county. On the mountains, we're all, um, every stream is a trout stream. Right. So we have quite significant buffer variances there that we have to deal with. Uh, the best thing to do is to use land that's already owned by the government. And that solves a lot of problems. All right, thanks so much.